Okay, so classical methods for model selection. The first one that we'll talk about is something known as stepwise regression. Stepwise regression. Okay, so this is this is a way that I can select four variables one at a time. Select four variables one at a time, walking through combinations of variables. Okay. So we had briefly talked about this last time, but the larger the number of variables, okay, then the more combinations of variables there are. And this scales in a property of two to the K. So essentially every, approximately every variable that you add doubles the number of possible combinations. And so the types of methods that we're gonna talk about are sort of really powerful in helping deal with this particular issue so that we don't have to go through sort of manually or to necessarily look at every possible combination. These are our sort of simplifying, uh, let's call them algorithms to help deal with this sort of fundamental issue that you may have lots and lots of combinations of, of variables. Okay, so we're gonna go through the sort of algorithm to do this. Um, in English first, and then I'll show an example of this um, sort of manually, and then we'll look at this in code. So the first one, there are two versions of stepwise regression. The first one is called forward stepwise. Okay, so one, choose a model with no predictors. Step two for K equals zero up to total number of predictors K. We will A, add one additional parameter and test all remaining um, different predictors. And then in step B, select the best as having the smallest uh, 
RSS or R squared value. And then lastly, select best overall based on selection criteria. Okay, so these are the steps for forward stepwise regression. This is kind of the formalized way of um, talking about the algorithm in English. Okay, but what the heck does this mean? Let's think about this in sort of a more practical example at the way this works. Let's suppose you have uh, you have your y, and then you also have x1, x2, x3, x4. Okay, so the way this is going to work uh, is I'm going to start off with a simple model. Um, so this is kind of step one, choose a model with no predictors. So that's going to be y is equal to beta zero, right, plus your error term. So this would be something like if you have a bunch of points, it would just be kind of your average, right? There's no slope. You just have an intercept. Okay, so this is step one. Okay, we're going to go into two, um, part A, 2A. So now I'm going to essentially test uh, through all of my different Ks. So this is going to look something like Y is equal to beta zero plus beta one X one. And then in 2B, I'm going to determine my R squared value. Okay, let's just hypothetically say the R squared of this is equal to 0.5. Uh, now I'm going to repeat my step 2A. And I'm going to add in my next variable. So y is equal to beta zero plus beta two x two. Okay, and here in two b, I'll figure out a different r squared. So let's say this is equal to point five two, and so on and so forth. So y is equal to beta zero plus beta three x three and y is equal to beta zero plus, actually, I think I'm just gonna do, I'm gonna do just three. Four will take a little too long. Uh, let's say this r squared is equal to 0.48. Okay, so this is my first instantiation. Let's use some different colors. Oops. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to identify of the combinations in within a specific within one group. Um, I'm going to look at the one with the highest R squared. So that's this guy here. Okay. 
now I'm going to move on to sort of repeating the outside step. So now I've essentially decided this is the best one with a single parameter. I'm gonna use this as the starting point for looking at the one with uh, two parameters or two variables. So y is equal to beta zero plus beta two x two. And then I'll look at all the remaining uh, variables that are left. So there's just two combinations. There's beta one x one, and then there is beta zero plus beta two x two plus beta three x three. And let's say this R squared is equal to 0.57. And let's say this R squared is equal to 0.6. Okay, so similar to what I did in the first step, I'm gonna take the one that has the highest R squared and move on to iterate again back to the beginning of step two and do something like this. Now I only have one possible combination of three variables. So that's just gonna look like this. Y equals beta zero plus right, beta two X two plus beta three X three plus beta one X one. Okay, and so let's say the R squared here is 0.65. Okay, so this is our kind of default. Okay, so what do you guys notice about the R squared as we add more variables? It's always increasing, right? And we expect this to happen, right? We've talked about this. As you add more variables, your R squared will always increase. Um, because, you know, at the very least, I could just have this part be zero, and it would be, at the very least, the same R squared. Um, but if it's not, you're capturing essentially a little bit more variation. Uh, so what is the concept that we talk about if, as you add more variables um, that we're worried about? Over. Overfitting. Yes, exactly. So how do I know? Okay, let's say I've sort of identified the sort of individual ones, right? How do I know whether I'm sort of overfitting in each of these? Is there any way we can deal with that issue? Yes, right? So all the criterion that we talked about last time specifically are meant to control for um, issues like overfitting um, in, in slight, they all do it in slightly different ways. So now I can apply a different criterion here. I can do a measurement of AIC. I can do BIC. I can do adjusted R squared. I can even do um, a cross-validation MSE, right? And I can apply this to each of these models. And that's what step three is, okay? I reevaluate this, taking into account these metrics to select which model is the best. And so let's suppose that this one gets overfit, this one's underfit, and this one's just right. Maybe these things will tell us that. And the algorithm for your forward stepwise regression has landed you on telling you that this is kind of the best set of variables based off of this kind of um, procedure that we used. Yes. I don't know how to 
Uh huh. The order, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Sorry if I made this confusing. The order doesn't matter here. Um, I was just, I was just maintaining the same order that I was doing here. X two, then X two and X three, and then X two, X three, X one. Right. So I totally did that, but even that that's our final one. Yep. Wouldn't you always? Then let's say like the R squared is different. Yes, you, you would. would. Get that yes, that's right. Okay, but you need to go through the other two to find out which one is not the Uh, kind of. Okay. Let's look at the let's say benefit of doing it this way. Um, what are my possible combinations? I have, I'm just going to write them all out here. So x1, x2, x3, x1 and x2, x1 and x3, uh, x2 and x3. Um, and then x1, x2, x3. Uh, is that right? Yeah. So How many combinations of variables are possible to look at? Seven. Seven. But here we only looked at, I guess, six. It doesn't seem as good. Okay, wait. All right, hang on. Let it, let's, let's say I have x4. Now the combinations are going to get way bigger. Okay. Um, let me do this more systematically. Uh, X1, X4, X2, X3, X2, X4, X3, X4, and X1, X2, X3, X1, X2, X4, um, X, one x three x four x one this is why i didn't want to do four uh sorry x two x three x four x and i think that's it and then x one x two x three x4. So if you do stepwise selection, the whole point of doing it is to reduce the number of total combinations that you're looking at. So if it so happened that in the first step, like this was the best one, then the only ones that you would look at in the second step would be this one, this one, this one, and then let's say that then this one is the best, x2 and x3, then you'd only look at combinations that have both of those. So that would be this guy and this guy, and then this guy. So in this case, your stepwise selection has reduced you down from 10, 15 down to seven, so half. Okay. So I think what you're asking is like, hey, we always end up here, which is true, right? You will always kind of look at this, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that's always going to be the best one because we're going to do this at the end to kind of decide. And the best one would be out of yes. So hang on. What if this was the best R squared here, but then this one is the best R squared here, you miss it. 
and there's nothing you can do about that. Life kind of just sucks, right? Um, but this is kind of the trade-off that you're making for reducing the complexity. Um, remember, uh, we went from six up to seven, right? So every time, uh, every time I add an additional variable, how many more combinations am I looking at in a stepwise regression? Let's say I go from X3 to X4. This is, you guys can just count literally, right? So how many here? So there's six here, right? One, two, three, four, five, six. In X4, there is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. What do you guys think? When I add X5, how many more steps? One more, okay, eight, right? Because think about what's happening here, right? You're going one variable, two variable, three variable, then four variables, then five variables. Um, so, you're essentially okay it's uh sorry it'll be it'll be slightly more um because you're going to get some other sort of combinations um but the number of combinations that you could be looking at if you looked at everything is doubling right so this increases linearly looking at every combination increases exponentially that's why stepwise regression is a useful tool. Let's say we're at like, you have a table that just has like 10 variables, right? Looking at all combinations of that is already absolutely ginormous. You're talking about thousands and thousands of combinations. Whereas here you'd be looking at, you know, a, a dozen steps essentially. Okay, makes sense to everyone. Um, Yes, okay. There is something also known as backward stepwise selection. Um, so same as forward. Uh, but start with a model with all predictors and remove one at a time. Okay. So it's almost exactly the same stepwise, except you do something like this. I start here, this is my step one. Then I loop through all the combinations, subtracting a variable. And so, okay, this is actually gonna look slightly different um, because here, I will also look at y is equal to beta zero, um, omitting x2. No, oh, where's my laser? And let's say this R squared is 0.58. So here, I start here, I take one variable away at a time. I look at the three possible combinations and I determine this is the best R squared. So now the difference is 
I, I'm only allowed to look at these two in the last one. So I wouldn't even be looking at this. And that's how you reduce some of the size. So it's the same kind of logic that you're applying as you step forward and step back to reduce the number of combinations that you're looking at. Okay. Any questions or confusions here? Yeah, 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 yeah. okay. Um, let's, let's do this explicitly. Okay, I'm gonna walk through. Uh, I'm gonna walk through the backward stepwise regression. So I'll have y equals beta zero plus beta one x one plus beta two x two plus beta three x three. This is our starting point. Similar, uh, completely sort of in the opposite of the original one where we were just doing y equals beta zero. So we're starting from the other end now. Okay. And then this has some kind of R squared. Doesn't actually matter for this step. Then we go through the combinations by removing instead of adding one variable at a time. So there's three possible combinations here. So this will be the first one. Then we have the second one. And the last one. And here I will again look at the R squareds. And let's just say 61.6.59. Six, I don't remember what I wrote before. Okay, so this is the highest R squared. We're going to go with this. And that means I will do the same thing. I'll take away one at a time here, which means the last set that I'll be testing will be y equals beta zero plus beta one x one and y equals beta zero. Okay, but I don't look at x3, because the one here that I'm subtracting from doesn't have x3 in it. Okay. And this will have some r squared. Point five. Point five one which we don't actually necessarily need to care about because that's the last step. And now, well, actually a whole. Actually, we do, we, sorry, we do care about this because it's, you select amongst the best one for each thing. And I now apply this to determine which of these three are my best ones. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there are sometimes people will there, there's an old school way that you do stepwise regression based off of the p-value of the variable instead of the R squared. Um, but that's been kind of demonstrated to not necessarily be a very good practice. So it is possible that when you do this, like you could theoretically drop something that has like 
statistical significance. It's not super likely because generally the R squareds are gonna be somewhat corresponding to, but you can imagine a case where this is true, like if, if the effect of the variable is really small, it's statistically significant, but it only captures a very small variation in the model, then it, then it could be dropped. Um, and in principle, that's like totally fine um, because you want basically to explain what's going in the, on in the model. And that variable might be something that has a real effect, but has a very small effect in the model. Um, so yeah, generally we consider that not very good practice anymore actually to do it by the p-value instead of um, uh, some of these other metrics. I mean, I would say that probably this is the bigger, more important step for the selection than the R squared. So if you do want to go with p-value, um, I think as long as you're doing this on the sort of outside, um, then it's probably okay. If you're, some people used to do like R squared, just do the R squared or p-value and then you get, you don't get um, to, to deal with the issue of overfitting that way. Okay. So hopefully everyone gets the concept of stepwise regression and the difference between forward and backwards. You're gonna have to know this for your homework. So, uh, yes, yeah. Yeah, oh, what if you have the exact same R squared? Uh, that'll never happen. <laughs> if that happens, you can, um, you can call me up and I'll, and I'll figure something out for you. But uh, I've been doing this for a while that I don't think that'll ever happen. Not with real data anyways. You could probably artificially get it to happen, but yes. Uh, that's just the starting point. Um, it's just uh, like in theory, you, your best model could be like no predictor, uh, right? Let me. Okay, like this is a very artificial example, but. If there's no variation in your y's as it relates to x. Okay. Then my no predictor is just an intercept, right? That looks something like this. And then as soon as you add predictors, you'd be overfitting, right? Because I could do, you know, something like this. Um, so yeah, unless, okay. I mean, it's, it's unlikely this will ever really happen, but it's just kind of a default starting point. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, so generally my suggestion is if you're gonna do one, you should just do both because they may actually come with different answers, right? Because the coverage of the combinations that they're looking at will likely be different when you go forwards versus backwards, right? In addition, deciding on the best one with an AIC versus a BIC also will probably be give you a different answer. So this, Think of it this way, you have all these variables and let's just say you don't know anything about your model relationship between all of these. You've got tons of combinations and you just like don't wanna look at all these combinations, okay? Um, the stepwise selection is helping you narrow down amongst all of these combinations, kind of what's the best model to look at, right? Um, and I can actually come to slightly different 
final answers with a with a forward stepwise, backward stepwise, if I decide to look at it with an AIC or a BIC or an adjusted R squared. Um, but if I'm looking at a, if I look at, let's say a data set that may have 10,000 different combinations of variables, um, the, at the worst, when I do forward and backwards, let's say you get two sets of things and then here, these are all, let's, let's say hypothetically, they're all different. I now have eight sort of models to look at as opposed to however many thousands, right? And I've narrowed it down and now I can look at just those eight and think about what that means, do other diagnostic tests, right? To dive a little bit deeper. So, um, you know, you don't even have to look at this necessarily as like your final answer. This is like a giant filter to help you narrow down possible models. Okay. All right. So let's jump over to R and let's program um, let us program as a as a custom function these steps right here okay so all right give me one moment Okay. Um, I'm going to load in this library, which you guys will probably need to install as a new package for the first time. Uh, so if you recall, you do it like this install dot packages ISLR. Um, ISLR is actually, this actually stands for, what does it stand for? Um, it stands for Introduction to Statistical Learning. This is a textbook, um, a statistical test textbook. Actually, a lot of the sort of latter half of this class derives material from, from this. Um, I think it's one of the sort of uh, reader-friendly, intuitive uh, textbooks uh, in, in sort of intro to data learning, um, data analysis, machine learning type of uh, category or, or topics. And this library contains uh, a bunch of data sets uh, that are kind of handy to do analysis on, which is why we're loading it here. We're going to look specifically at one uh, data set that comes out of the ISLR package. Okay. And oops, I have to have a quote here as well. We are going to also use a package called glmnet. Uh, so this is, so despite the fact that we're gonna custom build a stepwise regression function, Okay, obviously people aren't building these on their own all the time. Um, there are existing uh, libraries that have the ability to do forward and backward stepwise regression for you. We're gonna build the function ourselves just to make sure that everyone has kind of a firm handle on 
what is happening here, because I don't want it just to be a sort of black box for everybody. Um, but GLM nets uh, contain some of the things that we're going to use as sort of pre-built functions. And I'm going to do data table. OK. I'll also just go ahead and load in ggplot, which we might use later. Oops. OK, so this is how I can load in the credit data set. And let's go ahead and take a look at this data. OK, so we have an ID variable, uh, income, credit limit. Um, this is your credit rating, number of credit cards that you might have, age of the person, years of education, gender, whether or not they're a student, whether or not they're married, ethnicity, and then their um, balance on, on their credit card, OK? So the idea here is to, so the, th the thing we're going to look at is whether or not we can figure out the best model to understand uh, a person's balance uh, in, in this. So Y is going to be balance, and then we're going to look at different combinations of Xs. Yeah. No, this data set is loaded through the ISLR package. So once you install ISLR, I'll go back here real quick. Um, you just type data credit. This is a slightly different way of loading in data. Um, it's kind of pre-built into the package, so you don't need to have anything downloaded, um, well, besides the package. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to quickly make a vector called credit.names. So if you do this, this will just give you all of the names of the columns here. Um, OK, why am I doing this? I want to prepare this so that I can essentially leverage this when I am walking through my stepwise regression. I'm going to look at sort of different combinations of these guys, right? And so I'm just pre-preparing a vector of the names. Uh, one thing to note is that I don't, there, I don't want to look at everything, right? So I don't want to include balance in here. This is our Y variable. So I'm going to drop this in a second. And also there's a column called ID, which is kind of just irrelevant. That's just the ID of the column. It's kind of like a row number essentially. So we're going to drop those two. Um, so rather than do it manually, I'll do it like this. OK, um, so credit.names, uh, I'm going to filter it. So I look at the names again, and I say not for the ones that include ID and balance. This is how you do that. So if I run this again, and then I go down to my console, and I look at credit names again, now it has omitted the ID and the balance um, the variables. OK. So now let's build a function to look at step forward regression.
I'm going to create uh, two sort of empty shell variables to hold things. And we'll see why this is relevant in a little bit. And the whole idea here is I'm essentially going to try and just transform uh, the English version of this algorithm into code. So the first thing is that I'm going to go through this for loop here. And so I'm going for, essentially I'm going to loop through the number of possible um, the number of possible variables in the model, right? And so we're gonna look through combinations of essentially 10. So you could say for n in one to 10, but really, you know, if you were making this flexible, you say one in length credit names, which is gonna be 10. Okay, so now we need to get a little bit tricky here. Um, each time that I step through the for loop, let's say I'm on my second step and I've already chosen one of the best, right? So let's say it's balance versus income, balance versus limit, balance versus rating, balance versus cards, so on and so forth. And let's say balance versus limit is the best R squared for the first one. The second time I step through, I have this list of names, but I've already chosen limit. So I can't have this in the sort of set of things that I want to test against. Otherwise I'd, I'd do something, it would be the, akin to saying Y equals beta two plus X two. And then in the next step, you could say, you could come up with a combination that's like Y equals beta two x2 plus beta two x2, right? You'd be doing it twice and you don't want that, okay? So I'm going to create a vector called available.names. And the whole concept behind this vector is that it's gonna omit the things that have already been chosen, okay? Okay, so this says I have all my credit names and the available names are those credit names except the things that I've already selected, selected variables, okay? And that is what this thing is up here in line 13. Those are the selected variables currently Nothing is selected the first time I go through the loop, but as we go through the loop, I'm gonna change that to update with anything that has already been chosen. Okay, and we'll see that in a second. And then I'm gonna have a couple other empty things that are just being held for a second. Oops. So line 16, best model hold. So this is gonna be, you know, let's say Y equals beta income, Y equals beta limit, Y equals beta rating. And we end up deciding that the limit is the best one. This is gonna be the thing that's like, storing that information for us. Uh, and then uh, this is going to be the thing that, that holds on to the R squared for this, 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 that, and, and so on and so forth until we determine which one's the best one. And then uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see what this is in a second. So now I'm gonna have a loop 
inside the loop. So the outer loop is the big one that's kind of loop that's going through, okay, what are all combinations of one variable, all combinations of two variables, then three, then four, all the way up to 10. The inner loop, right, is the one that says, um, okay, I'm only looking at one variable, and then I'm gonna look at these guys um, that, that are left, okay? So, yeah, the broader idea. So if you remember behind the screen, we looked at, uh, there was the green, blue, black, right? The outer one is the thing that's going through from my green to my blue to my black. The inner one is within the blue, all of the different things inside. That's the concept behind having two for loops here. Okay. Variables dot hold. Uh, this, let's say selected variables, right? The, in the first step, it's limit. We've decided this is the best one. So that's gonna go here. And then we're gonna loop through all the available names. So we're gonna look at income and limit. We're gonna look at uh, rating and limit, cards and limit, age and limit, education limit, and so on and so forth. That's what's happening in, in this step. It's gonna look at the available names I. So as you loop through everything except for limit, it's gonna grab just one of these at a time and combine it with everything that you've already selected. So in step three, let's say limit and rating are the two best ones. It'll then, this is the thing that will tell you income plus these two or cards plus these two or age plus those two and so on and so forth. And this collapse thing, the way this works, let me show you. Uh, paste. So if you just do something like this, um, hello, everyone, this is, this essentially puts a bunch of characters together into a single string. Um, and the default for what goes in between everything is a space if you use paste. But you can do something like, uh, uh, okay, wait. It's, it's collapsing vectors together. So, okay, let me, let me do it with our example. Um, let's do income and then let's do rating limit. Wait a minute. I wrote it incorrectly. It looks like this. Yeah. So it takes all the items here and adds these pluses in, in between. And that way you can just feed that line directly into um, your regression. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna pause for a second. Is anyone super confused? Questions? Wants me to go back through anything? Okay, we're gonna keep going. So 
So this is where we run the actual regression. Oh, actually, no, we're gonna set up the formula first. So we'll do something like this. So basically it's setting up the formula. This is like our X's, right? So then we're adding balance tilde here as the formula, um, which then gets added into the model. So where we actually run the regression. Like that, and that's gonna run that line model.hold is where you're actually running the regression and you're looking at all the um as it loops through it's going to run basically all all of the combinations in our stepwise algorithm and one of the things that i want to hold on to is this so this is the way i explicitly extract the r squared and um, so the way that it's gonna, you're gonna look at this is like, think about this is all kind of the blue step, right? In, in what I was drawing on the board, it's going to run each of those models and then it's gonna look at each of the R squareds. Um, okay, and this is kind of where the magic happens. Okay, right here, this is kind of where the magic happens. So this is kind of like a king of the hill type of thing, okay? I'm in my blue step and I run the first model and I look at that R squared and I hold on to all of that information. Uh, and the uh, essentially you only hold on to it if it is the highest R squared at the time. Um, otherwise, we'll ignore it, right? So let me see. Yeah, okay, let me. So x beta one, x one, beta two, x two, beta one x1 plus beta 3 x3 and so on and so forth essentially what this algorithm does uh, as I go through the inner loop, it looks at this and it says, oh, that's my highest R squared because I don't have any priors for the R squared. So grab this and hold on to it. And then it's going to go through the next one. And it's like, is this R squared better than this? No, it's not. OK, just go on to the next one. Go here. Is this R squared better than this? Oh, it is. Let's hold on to this information and drop this. That's what this if statement is doing. So now my new best R squared is the thing from R squared hold, oops, not four, best R squared. Okay, um, so now I hold on to the best of each of the models. Yeah, uh, yes, thank you. Right there. And so now this updates the, the available names as well, right, in the inner loop, which is gonna update the thing on the outside. And that's 
basically it. We need to do a couple updates. So selected dot variables. Best name selected dot variables. So in here, right, let's say limit is the one that gets selected. So that gets added into what was previously empty. And uh, the best name is limit. And now the next time I loop through um, from green to blue, blue to black, it now keeps that information in selected variables. Oops. And I'm going to store information about each of the models. So all dot models is going to essentially store analogously to what I was showing on the board, the boxed off ones in each color. That's what all dot models is. It's the best ones in each inner tier group. And I'm going to do print selected variables. Okay. And that's pretty much it. And now this should be it. We should be able to run this. Um, to see. Okay. So let's see what happens. Oh no, error, what did I do? Oh, I see, um, okay. Hang on a sec. So I think, okay, it worked. I think I have to do this. How many variables are there? Credit.names. There's 10. It's breaking in the last step. Um, I might have to do minus one or something. I will. I'll look into this, but okay, this still kind of works. Um, so if we have, let me see what happens if I call all dot models, it will print out all 10 of the models. So the result of the, of this code that I just wrote are the boxes. Now we need to do our AIC, BIC, adjusted R squared type of thing. So I can do, I, all of that information is contained within the models. So I can look at the AIC of all the models this way. And AIC prefers to do, uh, you want the lowest one. So in fact, we can see that there is overfitting in this model. Right. Uh, if you have all 10 variables, it's, it, it starts to go up higher. So we want to look for the smallest value. So 4819. So model number eight. So that would be. Oh, let me. That would be summary all dot models eight.
So if I look at the AIC, it's basically telling me that these are the variables that give me the best sort of predictors without overfitting the model. I can do that for BIC as well. L apply all models BIC. And in this case, it is also consistent. It's telling me model eight. Same thing. Let's look at um, the adjusted R squared. Something like this. So we want to look at the highest one. So it looks like number eight is also the highest. So in this particular case, we have agreements between AIC, BIC, and adjusted R squared, where the highest, um, the highest adjusted R squared and the lowest AIC and BIC are all pointing towards model eights as kind of our best model. Okay. Thanks, Siri. Okay. Any questions? Yes. Not a call. Okay, let's look at that after class. Also, the, the code will be available. So if there's any like um, mistakes or anything, and I'll, I'll try and fix this error that I'm having on, on my end before I post it. Okay. Great, so that is our sort of classical um, methods. Now let's take a look at some what I'm going to call sort of modern methods. So this is common in machine learning for model selection. So we classify this type of model selection as shrinkage or also called regularization. Okay. Um, when I run a linear regression, you'll remember that what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to figure out my slopes, right? By minimizing the error term, um, which is the estimate, my line that I'm making um, and the distance from each of those points. So this, right, this looks something like uh, in a formal optimization, minimize my RSS, which is equal to the sum of i, y, um, y i minus beta zero minus the sum of j beta j x i j squared. 
with respect to beta 0, beta 1, beta 2, so on and so forth. Um, dot, 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 theta n. OK, this is just kind of the more formal way. We've, we've seen this before, right, of minimizing your errors. OK? So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to um, add an extra term. Lambda times J. Okay, and this little lambda here, we're gonna call this a tuning parameter. Okay. So now my optimization looks something like this. Minimize my RSS plus lambda times the sum here. Okay, so let me actually, let me write out this full term. Um, so it'll be sum i y i minus beta zero minus this beta j x i j squared. And we want to minimize this. Okay, first off, my tuning parameter, what happens if this is zero? Yeah, what, what was that? Yeah, this all becomes zero. And now this looks the same as what I was doing before, right? This is this is what we've been doing in our linear regression. Okay, so just know the smaller this is, kind of the less of an effect, whatever the heck we're doing here is gonna happen. Okay. Um, okay, let's say you have your tuning parameter set at like one or some larger number. Um, what is happening here? If I ignore this term, you want your betas to be at some value in such a way that this minus that, right, is going to be as close to zero as possible. In other words, you want your line from your beta to try and match some kind of um, value from your observed y's. But now that I've introduced this, you can think of this as kind of a penalty term because now um, if I am making betas take on some value, I now have a penalty term that you know, goes against this part. And so what this effectively does, so uh, the betas that have an important effect will try to stay close to the true value, right? And it's doing that to make this as small as possible. But the betas that are not important will shrink.
So this is kind of a clever way of penalizing overfitting, right? I can add a bunch more variables and I could just throw the book at my regression, right? I have a thousand variables, we'll just throw them all in. Right? And we know that like the R squared will go up, but a lot of those, think about this in real, in, in real terms. Uh, if you are running these sort of regressions, you can imagine that a bunch of those variables kind of like don't really improve the model that much. And they will have some betas associated with them, but they're not really reducing the error of your model. And so by introducing this penalty term, all of those kind of useless variables get shrunk away to, uh, to a small value or zero or something like that. Okay, so this, um, this is known as a ridge regression that is what this kind of formula is doing in a ridge regression um it can be kind of more difficult to interpret if your k is large in other words if you have lots and lots of variables um, your betas will tend to shrink towards zero, right? As your tuning parameter gets larger and larger, um, and then these shrink to zero, but don't actually get to zero. Um, and you can imagine, right? This effect can eventually overwhelm everything over here. So if your tuning parameter is large enough, you could shrink all of your ver all of your parameters all of the betas to, to zero. Um, okay, let's look at the sort of other analog of this. This is known as a lasso regression. This is our other form of regularization. It's very similar to a ridge regression, but the penalty term is slightly different. So in here, this is just absolute value instead of squaring. That's the only difference between the lasso regression and the ridge regression. Um, and the sort of main thing to know about this is in a lasso regression, um, in a lasso regression, your betas can actually end up at zero as opposed to approaching zero in the ridge regression. All right, so we've got these two methods. Um, and this is, again, to back up for a second and give context, right? These are essentially different versions of model selection. So these are kind of more modern ways of doing similar things to what the backwards and forward stepwise regression is doing. You can have a bunch of different, you can have a bunch of different variables and these guys are going to, instead of like dropping them discreetly, uh, 
they're going to tell you the effect of all of those. Let's say you have a thousand variables. Um, it will tell you which ones are kind of the most important via uh, shrinking away the betas of the non-important variables. Um, and that's dependent on your tuning parameter, right? So again, think of the tuning parameter as how important we think the overfitting is. So what do you guys think? What is, how should we select the tuning parameter? Yeah, so the, uh, what I'm asking for is in the in either the lasso or ridge regression, the tuning parameter basically determines the extent to which we think the model is being overfit. So how can we decide on some kind of metric for determining what our lambda should be? So this will be a common theme through the rest of the class. Anytime I uh, ask this question, it's probably gonna be cross-validation, right? I can choose a bunch of different lambdas and I can do my out of sample validation and figure out which one, which model gives me the best predictions out of sample. And then I will use that lambda as the one um, to represent the results that I want out of my regression, okay? Okay. Questions, confusions about this? We will, uh, yeah, if you don't have kind of a sort of firm understanding of this yet, that's okay. I'm going to show some practical examples of this and hopefully then you can see maybe what's, what's happening um, in these types of regressions. All right, so back to our studio. Okay, so we're gonna look at RID and lasso regression. I'm just gonna set up the data into a data table. And I'm going to get rid of my ID variable. We don't need that. And that's going to let us do something like this. I'm going to have a plus zero to indicate that I don't want an intercept. Um, and that's because the default in my ridge regressions and lasso regressions don't have an intercept. So what I want to do is do a comparison. Um, oops. Hold on. So here's my linear model. This is um, all of the variables are included. So if we look, it'll look something like this, right? We have um, all of my coefficients for all the variables in the credit model. And here I need to create a model matrix of my x's getting rid of the balance variable okay so let's look at the ridge regression this uses the function glm net 
and you have to specify your x's and y's in vectors and matrices, slightly more complicated than in your LM function, but it looks something like this. This is how you prepare it in your x and y. Um, okay, alpha equals zero. This is telling, uh, wait, let me, let me verify here. Yeah. So, okay, basically what I'll say is alpha equals zero is ridge regression, alpha equals one is lasso regression. Let me make a note of that. Alpha equals zero is for ridge, alpha equals one is for lasso. Uh, and we should, we're gonna start off with a lambda value of zero, right? So this term is zero, therefore this regression should be the same as our initial regression. So let's see if that is true. So I run my ridge and let's see here. I think I can do this. Yeah, so ridge, I think it's like ridge beta. Okay. So ridge beta, these betas look like this compared to, um, what did I call it? The linear model. And so these estimates should be very close, if not the same. So you guys can check that. So point oh, I, oh wait, I needed to have gotten rid of ID. Why is ID in there? One second, maybe I didn't run this. Okay, ID should not be there. Okay, great. Income negative 7.8, limit 0.19. Let's see if that holds up. Hopefully. Yeah, negative 7.8, uh, and then here are 0 0.2. It's not going to be exactly the same. Um, I believe GLM net actually re reverts to doing this um, numerically instead of analytically. So these will be approximations, um, but generally you'll have essentially the same when I set the tuning parameter equal to zero. Okay, so here, Okay, let me put some notes here. Um, so here you don't need to copy along the code. I'm, I'm gonna paste some, some functions in and I'll kind of describe what's happening. Um, again, this will be posted online. So now we want to pick the optimal Lambda, okay? Um, and the way I wanna do this is via cross-validation. I have sh I've given an example of doing like a k-fold CV, k-fold cross-validation um, before in class. And all I'm gonna do is reappropriate that function that we've already looked at and use that for this purposes, looking at a sort of range of lambdas. So essentially what's gonna happen here, I'm just going to pick a value for lambda. I'm gonna perform the cross-validation get the test mean squared error, right? So the predictions out of sample. And then I'm going to repeat steps one through three across a broad range of lambdas. Okay. And then the final step to pick the best model, select the lambda, which yields the lowest average test mean squared error. Okay. So let me...
Okay, let's see here. So this function k fold CV again is reappropriated from the function that I had shown in a previous lecture looking at cross validation. Um, you know, we do the whole assign, you know, a if it's like a five fold cross validation, we're going to assign a new column of index values. We'll leave those guys out as we run through a particular um, model. Same. Same deal here. Um, so I'm going to run this k fold. And then I'm going to uh, I'm going to use that algorithm to determine my out of sample mean squared error for any model that I feed into it. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to run through a whole bunch of lambda values. Um, and you usually, you usually do this in orders of, of magnitude. So this is going to be um, in sequences from 0 to 10 to the 0 to 4. So my lambda value will be 10, then 100, then 1,000, then 10,000, and so on and so forth. Uh, and I'm going to look at the out of sample mean squared error for each of those, um, each of those lambda values, OK? And that will look something like this. So we'll run through these. And let's take a look at what this looks like. So this plot is showing that as I go through different lambda values, my out of sample mean squared error, right? We, we would expect, if you remember, something like this for my error term. Um, in this case, the larger this is, the kind of more you're going this way, because that's referring to, um, that's referring to the, overfitting aspects, right? So the larger this is, um, the more you're penalizing overfitting. Um, so you're trying to reduce model complexity. And that's what we're seeing uh, happening over here, OK? So let me, let's see. What happens if I do this? Okay. So what are we looking at here? This is kind of the, um, this is kind of like the punchline of what's happening here and what's happening as we, changing, as we change the lambda. When lambda is equal to zero, we have different coefficient values. So each line 
represents one of those variables that we're looking at, okay? So if you ran a linear regression, you would get a point here. So this is a student. So if you're a student, the coefficient value out of your linear regression would be right here. And then each of your other variables would have values at sort of different points here. We start turning up the tuning parameter that basically says, okay, if that particular variable is not important, I want you to start penalizing it and making it sort of shrink over time. Okay, and so we, we start cranking up the tuning parameter to give a bigger and bigger penalty to overfitting. And that's gonna start affecting variables differently. If we look carefully here, um, okay, this one's kind of overshadowing everything, but look at, for example, this pink purple line compared to this green line. You can see that one of them, as we crank up the tuning parameter, starts to drop off faster than the other one, which is kind of a qualitative way of saying, well, this thing is probably having a more important effect on reducing my, um, my, uh, my errors than this one, right? And you can have a sense of kind of how important each of the variables are depending on how quickly they get shrunk to zero. Does this make sense to everyone? Okay, and so you can have like a whole bunch of different models um, based off of different values of the tuning parameter. So then we say, okay, which one's the best one? Uh, and that's where the cross-validation part of it comes in. Each one of these, like if I imagine a vertical line as representing a specific model, each one of those will have some ability to predict out a sample. And so we just pick the point at which uh, the, you get to the best uh, out of sample mean squared error using cross validation. Okay. So this is kind of a more complex version of doing this model selection compared to your forward and backwards stepwise regression, but it is letting us get a, a sort of more robust picture that you can apply to um, very many variables um, compared to a, a step forward and step backwards regression. We talked about you might like miss some combinations, right? Uh, whereas here, that's not gonna happen. Yes. Uh, no, no, it's it's not just the size. It's not just the size. It's kind of like the like when it when it shrinks away. The earlier it shrinks away, the more the less important that variable is compared to other things. Because just because the size of the coefficient doesn't necessitate that it's better. <clears throat> right. So imagine in a linear regression, you have all these coefficients like that, that might not be statistically significant, but these ones might be right. Something like that. So it's not the size of this that that matters. It's kind of how like at what point it starts to shrink down relative to, to other ones. So this, what I, what I would say by looking at this particular plot is this, like, for example, this purple line is clearly shrinking faster than this green line here. So I might say that this, this one is more important. But this is more just to give you guys like a qualitative sense of what's going on in the ridge and lasso regression. The actual conclusion that I want to draw from doing this analysis would be more along the lines of um, let me let me do this.
Um, all, all of the things that I'm kind of going over right now are to, to try and make sure that you guys kind of understand like what this is doing in sort of the modeling. Ultimately, the answer that you want is like the model that gives you the lowest out of sample mean squared error. Um, and so the conclusion that I would try and derive from running this model would be going through the cross validation, figuring out, um, figuring out what the best lambda to use is, and then applying that in the ridge regression to get your sort of final model. And in the same way that you would run like a linear model, if you were to use like stepwise and you come to a final model, like whatever that lambda is, would be kind of the, the best thing, uh, the, the, the conclusion, and then you could have your beta values that kind of describe that model. So you, so you could do this whole process to, to do that. Um, obviously, you know, the creators of GLMnet don't assume that you're gonna like make your own um, cross-validation function. Um, but I did that kind of explicitly, again, to make that not so much of a black box. They'll do it automatically for you. So it looks something like this. Ridge.best would be CV GLM net. So that's cross validation GLM net. X equals X, Y equals Y, alpha equals zero. And this runs everything that I, all of that code that I just did essentially kind of more efficiently behind the scenes as kind of like a, a as a black box. So all of the stuff that I did before is contained within line 100. And you can do things like this, same kind of plot for the mean squared error as you change lambda and um, I plot this same plot for how the coefficients change over time sort of automatically. And if you want to see what the actual regression is, it would be this. So once you've run that, you can extract the lambda value from ridge.best and say, what's my lambda min, and this gives you essentially your final answer. So if I look at ridge.auto dollar beta, this is ultimately, this is ultimately what you want, right? This is the kind of best model, taking all of these things into account and then affecting your betas in such a way that it, it essentially accounts for overfitting so that you get the best predictions out of this model compared to say, right? If, you, if we look back to the linear model that contains all these variables, the betas will be different, okay? Okay, so that is, we'll say the end of um, our discussion about these uh, shrinkage and regularization models. Um, and we'll cover a couple of other sort of modern methods um, in dimension reduction next time. Uh, yeah, but we'll end here for today. Um, I, 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 I,